Stanford University. Good evening. My name is Bob Gregg. I'm the director of the Abbasi Program in Islamic Studies. We have a very full program this evening, a movie that is almost an hour long and then a discussion. So I want you to get comfortable and settle in. Uh, I'm also going to be very brief in my introductions. You can find the people whose names I'm going to give you on websites and discover all their works. John Esposito, university professor at Georgetown University, once again honors us here at Stanford with his presence. Tonight he will discuss the research that he and Dahlia Mogahed uh, conducted on the results of the Gallup Organization's World Survey of Muslims. Their 2008 volume is entitled, Who Speaks for Islam? And we've used its subtitle in our advertising for this event. Author and filmmaker Michael Wolf, a steady friend of and steady contributor also to our work in building the study of Muslim societies and Islam at Stanford, um, has graciously brought us as a sneak preview his film concerning the Gallup survey. So after the film, uh, John Esposito and Michael Wolf will take this stage or these chairs, uh, along with the evening's moderator, my colleague in the Abbasi program, Dr. Azim Nanji. Uh, we should thank these three for being here. Uh, art of Silicon Valley. Uh, technology can break down. <laughs> uh, earlier today, uh, I was at a presentation by uh, Professor David Carrasco of Harvard University. And he was using a term that came to mind as I was watching the film. He used the term borderlands. That the notion that uh, people actually live in exclusive spaces uh, which are impermeable uh, no longer is no longer a valid way of looking at society. Societies come together, they, they collide, uh, they mingle, they create syntheses and so on. And therefore, it makes it much more important for us is that we understand those spaces where connections are taking place, whether they <coughs> are positive or negative. And I think one of the important consequences of the Gallup poll, and, and I think the, the work that has been done both uh, through the film as well as through the publication, enables us, I think, to see this space that we have often perceived uh, as a space of conflict. But it's also a uh, potential uh, opportunity for it to be a space of understanding. And that's what I think our program and this particular event is meant to uh, illuminate. And so I'm going to open up. Uh, to everyone uh, to see if we have uh, questions from the audience. And uh, both Professor Esposito and Michael Wolf will be happy to answer these questions. Uh, my job is to moderate, uh, but uh, I'm not sure what it means yet. So we'll find out as we go along. Uh, are there mics that are going around uh, that we can use? Yeah. Can, can people come up to, to the microphone and, and ask their questions? <clears throat> yeah, uh, a brilliant film, beautifully done, technically superb, fascinating, and useful, given the atmosphere we live in. But I wanted just to raise a couple of questions, if I could, this being a university. <laughs> um, you say, John, early on, we can let the data speak for itself. The words, the data, appear repeatedly through the film. Not some data, not partial data, not a little piece of data, but the data. The film ends with your colleague saying, we engage the world based on facts, not fear. So the empirical basis of this film which is also very much evident in the book that accompanies the film, is really quite clear. My question is, why is that data unavailable to scholars such as myself and others around the world? Let's remember that reliability depends upon the ability of other scholars and other researchers 
to use the same data and reach the same conclusions. There are questions, for example, about the questions themselves. One of the questions that was asked was, do you think that a woman should be able to have any job she is qualified for? The answers were encouraging. But is it not possible that a respondent would have restricted the number of jobs that he or she felt that a woman was qualified for? Response set is a technical term that survey researchers use to try to get at these problems of questionnaires. We have no quality control, at least evident in either the film, or if I may say so, in the book. The statement is made, jihad always has positive connotations for Muslims. I can attest that this is simply not true. I work in Southeast Asia. It would be amazing if the use of jihad by terrorist groups had not had some effect on the minds of Muslims as they themselves use the term. And in Indonesia, which admittedly is only one country, although a large one, Muslims try to avoid the word jihadi because they know that it means somebody who engages in violence and they don't want to be identified as jihadis. In the distinction that you make Excuse between... Excuse me for a second. Uh, okay, then maybe that's enough. It, it may be that you're on West Coast time and I'm on East Coast time. <laughs> I'm usually in bed about three hours before this, but you've already made three points. Okay, that's uh, fine. Sorry, John, and I like the book and I actually like the film. Thank you. It, it's okay. Uh, I want to expand the pool, so uh, that is my swimming pool, so keep that comment up. Um, to start with the last point, um, I think your first two points raise serious questions. I think your last point doesn't wash because if you really listen to what uh, Dalia Magahid is saying when she refers to jihad, she refers to a specific set of data on jihad. And that's referring to a particular poll that was done and the data that comes out of that poll. That, that doesn't mean <clears throat> that one can't talk about uh, other meanings of the term jihad in other parts of the Muslim world. It obviously is not saying, it is obviously is not saying that the uh, Gama Islamia, that the uh, Osama bin Ladens of the world uh, don't use jihad in the way that you're talking. So I, I think that there, there's a kind of miss. I think on the first part, I think you raise a very good question, and that is with regard to uh, the data. And we had a conversation about this uh, at dinner earlier. The reality of it is that um, the Gallup World Poll, which is the most comprehensive and systematic poll of the Muslim world, and which is done every year, it's been done again this year, and it'll be done for the next 100 years, um, at least that's what Gallup says. And I never take on a project that I don't see to the end, so it's been a very invigorating experience. Um, <laughs> and years from now, I will tell people about this conversation, probably about 70 years from now. Uh, as I remember our friendship. Um, the, the reality of it is that um, that polling is not done with any subvention from anyone in order to assure its independence. And therefore, at the end of the day, uh, in terms of releasing all of the data, as opposed to the data that is provided on the website, uh, in order to support this venture, it means that people have to buy it, plug into it. So we have government agencies that buy it, universities can buy it and, and then put it up uh, available to their faculty and their students. Um, just as, for example, uh, I'm editor-in-chief of Oxford Islamic Studies Online, which is a tremendous resource for people who want to know about the Islamic world, but you've got to pay for it. And that, that's a reality. Uh, and so that is, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, an issue. I think that uh, a university such as Stanford uh, despite the economic downturn, uh, ought to be able to uh, get that data, and, and I would encourage that. On the other hand, as I said to you uh, when we had uh, uh, dinner earlier, uh, I have mentioned to the Gallup folks that they need to make more of the data available, uh, and, and I will continue to mention that, but I think at the end of the day, part of it is, and it's not unique to Gallup, a lot of major work done on medical breakthroughs, et cetera, uh, they do not give away all the data. So if you have a report, for example, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's based on a study, it doesn't mean that if you go up there, you're going to find all the questions, all the data. But I, you know, I, I take the, the, uh, the point that you're making, and, and I will communicate that back to them. 
Thanks. Yes. Let's see. I, I accept the premise of the movie that the overwhelming majority of Muslims want to have a good life. One, one thing is it didn't distinguish between, it seems to me there was a lot of confusion between the Arab opinion and the non-Arab opinion. And qu one question is, are they significantly different? For example, do the Indian Muslims feel the same way as the Arab Muslims? Another concern is, while one says only 1% of the 91 million are, are radicals or jihadists or terrorists, that's still a million people. So we're still dealing in large numbers mm. of potential, quote, terrorists. Mm. W what I haven't seen very much of, and maybe it's my ignorance, is the moderate community within the Muslim world speaking out and making their fe presence felt in the US media. I mean, the media will track bad news. Well, why aren't there more voices in the moderate world speaking out about some of these issues? Good questions. Uh, very Catholic of you being Trinitarian, three points, which is better than the previous speaker, who I can't figure out his religion because he was on to five. Um, <laughs> but, but that's okay. Um, um, they're, 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 I think that one of the things, I think, I think in, the, in the video, Right, you're here? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, um, in the video, by and large, if you, if you, if you uh, look, the, look at the book, you will see that the data is given across the Muslim world. In other words, you know, uh, you will see uh, Arab countries as well as South and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I think that what got a little deceptive for a second there towards the end was when Ken Pollock referred to the Arab world in a narrow sense rather than the Muslim world. And, and that sort of struck me in the particular context in which he said it. It sounded like the focus was on the Arab world. Uh, in general, on a lot of the big questions, for example, women's rights, desire for democracy, uh, there are significant similarities. On the other hand, on certain issues, depending on the country, it breaks out differently. For example, Turkey stands out in the Middle East on the issue of Sharia. Turkey has a much longer secular heritage, and so it stands out from other countries. Uh, Iran will, on a number of issues, stand out from uh, the Arab countries. On the 7%, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think I make the point in the video that that is a significant n uh, number. That is, it would translate into potential radicals, uh, 91 million people. But, but I think that what's, th there are two things important here. I think number one, what that statistic should be telling us is that the target of our public diplomacy should be that 7%. In other words, that we need to distinguish the mainstream out from that group. Uh, when Tony Blair was leaving office, uh, he had a conference in London that a number of us were invited to. And then he had a private breakfast with uh, major Arab and Muslim uh, religious leaders, think tank uh, people, and I was invited. I'm neither an Arab nor a Muslim because I run a, a, a center. And Blair said that he thought that what Britain and other countries had done was important uh, post 9-11 in terms of its policy, but there was one problem, and that is that they in focusing on, quote, the dangers of extremism, they did not interface enough with the mainstream of Muslim community. So I think, for example, American public diplomacy should be based on targeting the 7%. Why? Because although the 7% are people who will say that 9-11 was justified, when you look at their opinions and their attitudes, they are not people uh, who, A, are involved in violence at the time. They're not people who uh, necessarily indicate that they would be involved in violence, but more importantly, what is interesting about them is that they are people who um, believe even more than the mainstream in wanting better relations with the West and believing that democracy is the way forward, but are far more cynical. Therefore, they are people who should be targeted because our concern ought to be that not all 7% are going to go radical, but if they are not the people that we reach out to, to, to reach out to the mainstream is not necessary. What we have to be careful of, and I think Pollock makes a good point there, is not to alienate a mainstream. In other words, to distinguish between the extremist and, and, and the non-extremist. If I can use an analogy just based on my own background, uh, unlike most of you, I'm blessed to have been born to God's tribe, which is I'm Italian-American, and, uh, and I lived in an Italian neighborhood all of my life. But one of the things that I had a lot, a lot of problems with growing up 
was an awareness at an early age, both uh, in terms of the media, but also uh, when I went into a monastery for about 10 years, which was peopled by another alien group called the Irish, of whom I've never forgiven for it. And uh, their stereotype of Italians as mafia, you know, I mean, this continuous kind of thing. And even after I finished uh, and got my degree and was out, living in a neighborhood where we would go out to neighbors for dinner, and they would talk about Italians and mafia. And I would say to my wife after dinner, these are friends, don't they realize I'm Italian? And she would say, you're not Italian, you have a PhD. You know? <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, I would go to dinner with a Jesuit colleague, and he would ask me every year how my children were. And I'd say to him every year, I don't have any children. And you know, I'm not going to. And then it would be, how's your garden? How are your zucchini? You know? And then I would say, I don't do gardens, but I built my patio. And he would say, smiling, you know, and then I'd say, gotcha. You think we put people in cement or we build with it. The bottom line of the story is that I came, growing up, to really resent the fact that we weren't mafia, but I always had to feel that people were making me uh, uh, address that, that people were saying that about Italians. The real thing we need to do when we're dealing with the Arab and Muslim world is not to alienate the mainstream and to, and to target the extremists, which brings me to your last question. The question you raise is raised by everybody. Why don't more Muslims speak out, okay? Uh, I was asked that question at Georgetown. I took some medication and my mouth dries out. This is Bombay Sapphire, it's not water. Uh, I should turn this, was this your bottle or mine? No. Um, okay. Um, but, I mean, let me, let me finish with this. I've been asked by people, and in fact, uh, Tom Friedman wrote a column on this two years ago, okay? Tom Friedman wrote a column after the, uh, maybe three years ago, after the bombings in London, and again raised the issue, why aren't Muslims speaking out? And my colleague and I wrote a letter to Tom Friedman and basically said, here's the data. The data is, and we gave him websites, and I can do the same thing uh, if, if you give me, if you want, if you email me after. Not all of you, if you email me, I get inundated. Um, Muslims have spoken out since 9-12, okay? Major Muslim leaders around the world denouncing it, okay? If you don't see it in the media, ask the question about the media. The, the statements are all over the, the internet. We wrote this in to the New York Times, responding to Friedman, in effect saying, you're too bright to be that stupid. And we took you know, each of his points, gave the websites. That letter was never published, simply never published. And to this day, most Americans will say, why don't more Muslims speak out? The fact is, I mean, you know, when he used that phrase, what is it, if it bleeds, it leads. We did a special program with the Washington Post and Newsweek, and the editor-in-chief of Newsweek, who is himself, by the way, PhD, something of an intellectual, publishes a book every year, et cetera. But when asked by Muslims, why don't you cover these kinds of statements, you know, and why don't you cover more of the mainstream? He, he just said in a nice way, he said, you know, the media is concerned about clashing discourse. The media is concerned about Violence, it's the bottom line, that's what catches attention. And as a result, these statements are not out there. If I ask you, how many of you know what the Amman message is? Raise your hand. Okay, so we got one, two, three, about five people. How many of you know, not about, but know common word? Common word document. Okay, we're down to about three people, okay? Now, if I also ask you, just for contrast, so let's get off that topic, how many of you can stand up? If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to stand up and tell me and discuss the Patriot Act. Okay, we're down to two, three, four. Uh, how many can deal with secret evidence? Okay, one, two, three, four. There's where we are. We're talking about the first two are major Muslim statements uh, uh, that deal with the issue of major Muslim religious leaders across the world denouncing uh, the acts of, of violence uh, in the name of religion. The second is Common Word, major initiative uh, to all the leaders of major religious churches, to the Pope, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, dealing with the question that uh, however different we are, we need to work, who covers that? 
The last two are issues that we ought to be concerned about. They are major American legislation and what the implications are in terms of civil liberties. Most of us don't know what it is because the media just doesn't cover it. And, and that, that remains a significant, uh, uh, if you, if you uh, uh, Google media tenor, you should be able to get data from them. They're a major uh, uh, group that uh, monitors the media. You will be shocked at this disparity in terms of the kinds of things that media cover. Michael, you have just, somebody over uh, I, I oh, just Michael, wanted to yeah, pick one, one of the questions up and ask Michael if while you were making the film, did you sense uh, a difference in mood between the Arab world and the non-Arab world? Was there, was there a sense that somehow one was angrier than the other or uh, the intensity of feeling against the United States was stronger? No. no, not in the making of the film at all. So it, it sort of complements, I think, something that you've said that it essentially doesn't break into that kind of Oh, I wanted to make one point about the term jihad. When I was a graduate student, no, I'm sorry, when I finished my PhD, which would have been, I finished my PhD in 74, and probably some place between 74 and uh, 1974 and 1980, uh, I had lunch at the Temple Faculty Club with my professor, who was a Palestinian. Think about this, this is 1980, right? almost 30 years ago. And uh, I had been asked by the State Department to do some consulting, and this was unheard of in those days, that an academic, an American academic, would talk to government. See, what we did is criticize government in our classroom and in our articles, but we wouldn't go there because we didn't want to be compromised. Not that you can't be compromised. And I remember sitting with my mentor and saying, you know, do I do this because I know when you go out into the Arab and Muslim world, people always look in your eye and say, have you had, in effect, any contact with government? They translate that as CIA, basically. In other words, you have anything to do with government. And I remember my mentor saying to me, you should feel free to do anything that you want. He was a Palestinian in background. But out loud, he said, on the other hand, you could choose to roll up your sleeves and engage in the jihad, OK? This is in the 1980s when, on the one hand, I knew from most of my Muslim friends what jihad meant. It did mean to strive and to struggle, et cetera. Uh, but even then, there was a kind of sensitivity to it, you know, when, when he said it out loud. Because there have been extremists who have, in the name of uh, uh, religion, fighting oppression, um, have, have, have called for a jihad. But keep this in mind. Whether it was Stalin, Mao Zedong, Mussolini, who was probably Irish and not Italian, <laughs> um, or Bush or Clinton, or Saddam Hussein, all of them, when they go to war, say that they're fighting an oppressor, that their war is a just war. Even Saddam Hussein never said, come on, we're going to go into Kuwait and we're going to you know, rape and pillage. And so it shouldn't surprise us, you know, when we look back historically at the Crusades and a lot of other events, that people take religious symbols to motivate because they are so convincing. I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Can we go over that side? So, um, my question is pretty easy. Uh, I was just curious what was the most surprising um, few discoveries that you made uh, through your polling. And then I guess my comment was um, I think you guys should include a secondary audio uh, uh, track on your DVD and maybe get a little deeper into some of the things that you thought were interesting, almost like a director commentary, because you know, whenever you see a PBS show, you always want a little more afterwards. Um, I, I, if you're asking about the, the things that, that were surprising, uh, when I was asked to, uh, and I may have, first of all, how many of you have ever heard me speak before? OK, you leave, um, because <laughs> I'll probably repeat something. It's a problem when you live long enough that you worry about. But when I was contacted by Dahlia, whom I had never met, Dahlia McGuide sent me an email, and she said that there was this uh, poll, and uh, that Gallup wanted to talk to me. And I never responded to it. Because after 9-11, everybody wants to pick your brain. And, and they want to do it for free. And they just, you know, you go down, they want you to spend hours, et cetera. Then she sent me another email, and she said that the Gallup CEO wanted to talk with me. So I thought, well, if it's the CEO, why not go down? And I have a taxi driver, Emmett, who drives me when I do things. And I said to Emmett, this will be 15 minutes. So I figured I'd go in, he's going to pick my brain, et cetera. I was mesmerized, simply because when they talked about the data, a lot of what they were talking about was at least based on my experience at that time of some 35 years, a lot of it resonated. 
But what really did surprise me were things like the numbers of Muslim men, not just Muslim women, who believed that women should have equal legal rights, equal access to education, equal. Now, the question becomes, then why don't they? But then you've got to ask yourself the question. What's the nature of the government? What's the nature of the elites? You know, what's the nature of you know, the people that make this happen? That surprised me a great deal. The other thing that really surprised me, I wasn't surprised that potential radicals were well-educated. I wasn't surprised that they're no more religious than anybody else. What I was surprised at was um, their, their desire for better, their belief, sorry, their belief that better relations to the West was very important to progress and that democracy was important to progress. What didn't surprise me was their cynicism, okay? And, 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 and it gets reinforced today. Uh, this is not meant as a, a, a direct criticism of uh, President Obama, although it is a criticism of a decision that he's made. I think he's made a lot of good decisions too. But if you look in the last week, Obama had promised a message to the Muslim world, okay? From my point of view, the most logical place in the Muslim world would have been Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia. He lived there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You also escaped the whole Arab track, as it were. He picks Cairo. Now that is same old, same old. Cairo is always seen as the leader in the Arab world. When my wife and I first lived in the Middle East, we lived in Lebanon. This is 30 years ago. We go, maybe longer than that, but let's say 30 years ago. Um, uh, we go to Egypt, and everybody in Egypt says, why do you live in Lebanon? We're the center of the world, okay? The reality of it is today is that the Mubarak government is not only despised within its own country, but in many parts of the, the Muslim world, particularly uh, in terms of its uh, election, uh, where it stood when it came to Gaza, or where it didn't stand, etc. cetera. Okay. Our president is going there at the same time that it's been announced that his administration is, is increasing the money we're giving to Egypt by 25%, <laughs> the majority of which is for its military. Now, with a number of countries in the Arab world, money that goes for the military is not used this way, it's used this way. They're giving a quarter of a million for, if you will, socioeconomic development, and the press reports say very directly that our government has agreed to Mubarak's stipulation that the money not simply go to NGOs, but to government-regulated non-government organizations, okay? I mean, so this is where we then run into this continuing problem where the 7% that are important just have a feeling that the promotion of democracy goes on every place but in their own area, that our support tends to be for authoritarian regimes. Unless we break that cycle, we can't get our credibility off the ground. And I think that's a real issue for the United States. It continues to be, including in South Asia now. Michael, any surprises for you in the results? Uh well, I like the uh, statistic about Canada. I think that's very mm. revealing. Mm. Um, and I was, um, I was impressed also with, with, what, um, with Dahlia's interpretation of religion. Um, that whereas we are frequently led to think that Islam is the cause of these particular problems related to violence in particular, that in fact, uh, it may be the solution to dissolving um, some of the uh, some of the underwriting uh, by uh, uh, religions using by by terrorists using the Quran in their in their fingers, in their hands, showing it next to their guns. Um, that it, that it may in fact be those women who are reading the Quran closely and saying, mm, no, the law that you just passed is not Quranic, and taking that to the streets. Um, we spent a lot of time, probably more time in this film than any other, making sure that the photographs that we used were, were true. In other words, if we had a, a picture of uh, women um, uh, waging jihad with a sign, those were four women in Darfur who were um, considering their demand for food and water jihad. Um, we tried in every case uh, to find uh, not only the right photograph, but the photograph that was tagged 
in the AP or um, whoever happened to Getty Images, whoever happened to own it, um, as that very thing. So that we were surely, we were sure ourselves um, that there was a certain uh, integrity and a commitment to actually uh, showing what we were saying uh, and, and what Gallup was finding in the film. The, the Canadians were 3%. Are they, is 3% of the audience Canadian? There we go. We have a few Canadians in the group as well. Uh, yes. You know, 9-11 was one of the worst tragedy for US. But the whole world knows about that. But there was another tragedy right after that in the shape and form of Patriot Act, INS special registration, and secret evidence, and follows a lot. That created a culture of fear, hate, anger, division. And Muslims are working towards creating a culture of hope, peace, and you know, inclusion. How can we make America feel that? And maybe it has to be part of your movie that silencing of the whole community, a whole group, is a tragedy in itself. I'm a founder of American Muslim Voice, and I live across from Stanford here. And since 2003, we have been open, opening our homes to our fellow Americans so they could come in. We have opened our minds, our hearts, our souls, our homes. If anybody is interested, I'm holding, holding an open house on June 7th, 4.30, at my home. That's the best way you can get to know who Muslims are. And I think that's what I'm urging both of you. When you speak to Muslims, please encourage them to really let our fellow Americans to know us, because that's the only way they can make judgments about us. We should not allow Osama bin Laden to speak for us, or Bush, or media, or anybody else. So help us spread that word for the Muslims. I know they're afraid, but we can do this. Thank you. There are so many things that we have in common. Mm. Thank you. I think it's an issue um, that we need to reflect on a lot more. You know, I asked you about Secret Evidence Patriot Act. The, this is our legislation. And it's not that some of this legislation isn't, 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 uh, 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 doesn't have a good purpose in mind, Patriot Act, for example. But I'm talking about how it's been used. So for example, I would suggest for those of you that like to read about this kind of stuff, it's a great read, too, which is rare. David Cole has written a book called Less Safe, Less Free. He's one of the top uh, lawyers who deals with issues of human rights that goes beyond Arab and Muslim world. He has a long track record. It's called Less Safe, Less Free, in which he looks at the legislation after 9-11 and says, as a, res as a result, we're less safe, we're also less free. Most Americans have no idea you know, what these tragic cases are like in terms of the impact on, on families and, and what happens to them. And, and, and Samuel Aaron, and, and, and the climate that's created. Uh, I gave a talk to a group of CEOs, and uh, this isn't true of all CEOs. Um, but what struck me was, I referred to the Japanese and their incarceration. And I said, you know, the risk we run is that we'll repeat that and I heard somebody in the back say, and it worked. And so I stopped and I said to him, excuse me. And he said, why should we be ashamed of it? It worked. And so what if we do it again? And then I said to him, but what would happen if it occurred to your ethnic group or your religious group? And he didn't have a response to that. Uh, I'm sure he thought to himself, well, it would never be you know, my group to which that would occur. I think that that is one of the issues. I think that. Uh, uh, President Obama has raised that. Whether or not he'll effectively deal with that, one of the, from my point of view, one of the sad things is that he said the right things, but so far his administration has not really moved very aggressively on that front. But I think that this is, because the whole point is, we should be targeting people who are extremists and terrorists. The fact is, if you look post 9-11, not at Europe, but America, if you look at FBI reports, if you look at the numbers of people arrested and how many were found guilty of, 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 of any crime, let alone you know, a crime of terrorism, the numbers are so small you wouldn't believe it. And yet I run into Americans all the time that ask me, how many embedded cells do you think there are? I gave a talk to a group of CEOs 
at the uh, Four Seasons in Washington. They came to meet with uh, President Bush and other heads of government. They were very prominent. And a guy got up in the audience and said, well, what do you say about the fact that 80% of American mosques are radical? And I said, well, where did you hear that? And it turned out one of the CEOs, only one of them, was a Muslim. Never gave a donation. But anyway, um, <laughs> but he was a Muslim. And he said, he said, well, we actually had a meeting in which somebody in the meeting from the government didn't say that he had the data. He quoted somebody, and he mentioned somebody's name, who is a Muslim basher in print, etc. But the point is that that statistic was out there. This group of CEOs heard it, 80%. And unless somebody challenges that, you know, you just figure, well, if nobody challenges it, and most people aren't going to challenge it because they don't know, you know, if somebody says it. And I think that that's been, for me, that's been the, the, the strange fallout from 9-11, realizing that the world has changed dramatically, not only because of that particular attack, but the risks that we run. Uh, if you get a chance, go to the Gallup website, look at the latest study, which was issued two weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago, on American Muslims. Okay? And then look at the one on Europe that was issued a week ago. What you will discover is that even in Europe, where you've had attacks and where there is a threat, okay, in fact, Muslim Europeans, the vast majority of Muslim Europeans, are far more open to their society and far more pluralistic in their hopes and their aspirations than indigenous, liberal, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of other data there. And I think that that's where it becomes important because unless you know people, then who are you going to rely on? You know, the person who steps out in front of the camera and makes a statement. Michael, much is being made of the media and its role. Can you say something about the work you've been doing <coughs> to begin to influence some of these images in media such as film, Hollywood, etc.? Well, there are two medias. There's the media of uh, news reporting, which no one has any control over, it seems. Um, and then there's the medium of the media of entertainment. And, um, and I work in the media of entertainment pretty exclusively. Uh, so I can't talk to you about Fox News or CNN or uh, PBS, really. I can't talk to you about any of that because I don't really know that field very well. Um, my sense about the entertainment industry, having uh, spent uh, the last couple of years in Hollywood a lot more than I ever have previous years of my life, um, is that it is um, largely populated by very intelligent people who would like to figure out a way to get their audiences to watch uh, films and TV programs that have a little more progressive and a little more sensible presentation of uh, uh, Muslims, of uh, the issues that we're facing uh, uh, amongst uh, various religions, and and yet there is the problem of the audience. Uh, you know, it's um, it's uh, a, a downtime in Hollywood. It's very difficult there right now, even to make a movie, let alone to make a movie that has uh, some vision. So um, they they they're uh, a little stumped, I find, um, in the feature film industry. Uh, Hence, a lot of adventure films, you know, that are coming out right now. Um, on television, however, it's a different story, and particularly in the series. In the series stories, you know, the medical programs, the legal programs, these are programs that you can cycle new characters in and out of over a, a week or two weeks or a four-week period. And a lot of them are very sensibly beginning to recognize that there are somewhere around four, five, six, seven, eight, nine million Muslims. We don't count by religion in this country, so we have to assume. But there are a fair number of people. And that if you thought of our population as a kind of class picture of its various representative uh, nationalities, religions, races, and creeds, um, that you would, there's a face missing, essentially, in the media class picture. 
and it's the face of the American Muslim. It's not there. And um, a lot of people in the television industry know that. They're aware of that. And they have been looking for and occasionally finding ways um, uh, to expose a, a very large television public um, that is very much influenced by what they watch um, to this kind of the new kid on the block, the, the American Muslim personality. Um, it sounds funny, perhaps, um, but if you think back to the Bill Cosby show in the 70s and 80s, um, coming out of the Watts riots and coming out of uh, a period when many white people were just frightened, they didn't even know why. Um, and, um, and Bill Cosby had the good sense to include on his editorial staff uh, a couple of African Americans. So it wasn't all just white input. And he produced a program which uh, probably had more to do with transforming the American opinion of um, the African American society and individuals in this country than any other single thing that I can think of. The same could be said of a range of, film, of TV programs, weekly programs, um, that uh, made a big change in gender equity in the country with um, women running newspapers and so on, things that were unheard of before these programs began to pop up one by one in the 90s and, um, and still go on. Um, and there are other examples. So if we're looking for for peace and understanding in a society such as ours, um, I would say the entertainment industry is a good place to, um, to work. Um, I don't mean that there should be, you know, great television series about American Muslims and so on. I mean, I, I really think that's actually missing the point. The point is that, that um, Muslims are a part of this fabric, they're part of the picture, they're part of the class picture I described earlier. So why wouldn't they be occasionally a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, there's the, uh, the joke about the, uh, you go to your doctor and he says, face Mecca and cough. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's got a Muslim doctor, it seems, or has had. There's a lot of Muslim doctors in the United States and lawyers and teachers and people with kids in schools and people paying mortgages and working hard and trying to make this place a little bit better country. And um, Hollywood seems to be, have a way, you know, of just kind of integrating in an effortless way uh, inside people's living rooms, which is a nice way to go about things. You don't have to march in the streets, maybe. Well, we're running out of time, but let's quickly entertain some of the questions. Uh, I just want to make a, a, a comment about a comment that you made, which I often hear. Uh, um, I think it's, it's um, to ask why don't Muslims or more Muslims speak out against 9-11 uh, and against terrorism is it treats of Western and American arrogance and ignorance. Because after, for example, after Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City, did everybody stand out and, he, and says why don't Christians, Americans stand out and condemn uh, violence? Uh, you know, because and speak, speak against uh, Christian and or, or white terrorism. And so this, not applying the same logic, is double standards and it reeks of ignorance and uh, um, Well, if you, if you frame it, in, thank you for your question. If you frame it in terms of fairness or inequity, of course it's unfair and, it's an, and it is an expression of inequity. But, you know, in fact, that is the position that um, many, many groups who have arrived in this country have faced and eventually, um, I don't want to say overcome because, you know, we just had six years of The Sopranos, you know, on HBO. I mean, the mafia thing goes on, right? You know? <laughs> it's, it's sort of... See what the Irish you know? do? <laughs> uh, but, but I'll bet that he's not mistaken so often for a mafia member as he used to be. You know, I would bet that that's true, that, that there was a different atmosphere around that topic, and for Germans, and for Japanese, and for Chinese. Uh, I mean, the Chinese story in California is horrendous. You know, just read the book. Um, so 
we as American Muslims are now facing this situation. It is exacerbated and perhaps set in, you know, by 9-11 and all that's gone on since. Uh, and it's conceivable, as I heard John say some years ago, that we're 30, set back 30 years because of this. That may well be true still. But the fact is that there is something about this country that makes us all eventually get used to each other. Don't ask me what it is. Maybe it's money. You, know? you do get to a point where you move a little, you move beyond. I mean, that is, you know, I mean, American Jews went through this, uh, ethnic Catholics did, you know, where you, you start to be accepted in the system. And, and I just came out with a six volume encyclopedia with Oxford, Encyclopedia of the Islamic World. But my people at Oxford, we had a whole group of people who were turning us down or not responding. So what I do is I send out a letter on my email and I, I ask them very pleasantly. And then I say, if you still don't think you want to contribute, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. Open the attachment. And the attachment is from the godfather, the guy in bed with the horse's head. <laughs> and it is amazing how successful it was. <laughs> Everyone I sent to you know, came back and said, oh, that's funny, but they did not say no. But, but here's where the stereotyping comes in. I found out my two editors at Oxford, their nickname for me was Tony Soprano mm -hmm. before I even did this. So you know, you're constantly dealing with, even when yeah. you move beyond yeah. The, yeah. The, that period. Even when you're a PhD. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yes. I want to say that Tom Friedman also doesn't get it, and he will never get it. That's my The Thank world you. is sometimes flat. Thank you. Here we go. That's right. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for the very important and needed documentary that, that you made, and I hope certainly that it will help towards healing some of the wounds that um, are still hurting. Um, but I did want to mention my personal experience with um, trying to familiarize just my local community with the type of, as an example of a, uh, a Muslim woman and what my beliefs are. And I find it very difficult to find a media through which to communicate. Um, I'm a faculty at Stanford University. I'm a researcher full time. And um, I have emailed to the Department of uh, Religious Studies at Stanford asking for a forum that may exist already in form, form of journal clubs that I may join to freely talk about these um, uh, Islam and uh, never gotten any response back. I've gone to local churches to say, I'm here, please ask me questions. I'm willing to answer. They're not willing to receive me <laughs> or give me time. So um, I do find this a, a very serious problem because not knowing is creating fear, uh, which is not needed. And in 1984, I took a, a college course in um, Prophets of the Old Testament. And in that, in that group of students and colleagues, um, everyone agreed that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were monotheistic religions, worshiped the same God. Um, two, two or three months ago, um, on the radio, through the media of TV, um, televangelists were saying, Allah is not the God of Juda Judaism and Christianity. Allah is, a, is some devil worship and it's a statue and it has nothing to do with God. And so we've actually gone backwards instead of forwards in understanding. Well, I'm not sure. Um, that may be when you turn the radio on. But those people have been on the radio for a long time. I, I used to hear them when I was, you know, like this, where I lived. Um, I, 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 would, I would say also that that message is directed to um, a particular slice of the population who are already uh, habituated to sending money to that person, and that that is actually what the transaction is about. Uh, the man with the microphone feeds the hatred, and the person who feels victimized, slighted, and unrepresented sends the money back, and that is the transaction. So. Until, um, you know, each of us has our own religion to clean up. God knows uh, Muslims have a big job ahead of them. And at the same time, so does Christianity. Uh, so does Judaism. It is really tough to be of any religion in this world today. Nobody's off the hook. 
And um, I, I think this is an example. And we can, I can hear the pain in your voice from this remark that had nothing to do with you, really. It had to do with that transaction. So thank you. Thank you for your... I do agree very strongly that we do have a lot of cleanup to do. And it's exactly that that I want to discuss. And there's no media for which I can express it, and so um, even locally. And so if, if you have um, any advice as to where I can plug into existing conversations, I would very much appreciate it. Blogging that. sites. Thank you. Blog sites. And don't stop knocking on doors. <laughs> okay, we'll go there, uh, and then we'll come back to it. Um, I have a, qu a specific question about the poll. Um, which is that I noticed that there wasn't any data on people living in Afghanistan. And I'm wondering, since um, that country is strongly associated with having a strong presence of Sharia and gender inequality, how that might be pro problematic in the way that the West receives that poll? The, uh, well, uh, uh, actually, uh, interesting you should mention that. Uh, this week or next week, um, there is going to be um, uh, a major presentation in Washington, D.C. at Gallup headquarters on um, a recent poll of Afghanistan. It's solely devoted to Afghanistan. Uh, and I would imagine that that data will wind up going up on the website within a month. But if you, you probably, if you actually went to the Gallup site, they might even, you might even see the announcement of the day that it's going to be given. And you could probably send an email to someone or if you want, at a certain point, if you don't find it, email me and I'll connect you. Just remind me you were here tonight, because you'll get a message that says I get lots of emails, I read them, but I don't answer them all. But just remind me you were here tonight. I, I do appreciate the, the intention behind the, the film, but I have a serious concern about it, and I will raise some of them. As a so. Muslim and Arab, who live in the United States. Um, one of the things that strikes me about the movie is the interpretation of the data. And I sh think we should call it Dalia and Jihad, what, what, what Dalia and Jihad want Muslims think, not what Muslims think themselves. Because one of the interpretation, for example, Dalia explained that the fact that women were in hijab in Islamic world is because they have this in sophisticated interpretation of the distinction between the exterior uh, and, and the interior uh, aspect of women. And I don't see that exactly existing in the majority of Muslim women thinking about that. There is a lot of tribal code involved in that uh, concept. There is a lot of culture value involved in the, the tradition itself. So the concern and, and the, with the concept of the, there is a great deal of uh, emphasis on the Sharia as a something very sophisticated and developed by between the interpretation of human mind to uh, divine law, which is quite a I mean, you're a scholar in Islamic tradition, I'm a scholar in the same tradition. We know that not exactly what's being done today. And most the Islamic law or jurists nowadays, they have their, their interpretation is derived from different, even in, involve a lot of things, culture and, and, and uh, uh, tribal codes and so on and so on. My main concern about this documentary is really will put a lot of pressure on a lot of movement for women's rights, for reforming Islam, for democracy. It seems to be, I mean, you describe in this movie, the image we get is like there is very much there is a utopia exists in Islamic world and we don't know about it. And, um, but the reality, there is none of this. I just came from Iraq in 2004 when I went to Iraq. Extremism on rise uh, among uh, Muslims there. Uh, so it seemed to be, I mean, the, 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 this, the intention is great, it's very honorable, but it seemed to be as a counterproductive in the sense that it will slow down this, uh, uh, the movement for women rights, for uh, reforming Islam, for democracy. We now there is a lot of problem exists in Islamic world. I do appreciate that it's present a positive image of Muslim. That's a great thing. As a Muslim who live in the United States, that will help me. That will make my life better and easy. But at the same time, I'm worried about the Muslim in the Islamic world who will seem to be will not get that help from us if we continue to be apologetic and we continue to really 
have very simplistic interpretation of their problem and we detach from their reality by using a simple data. There is certain interpretation developed among Muslim in the United States and it seemed to be Dali and Jihad taking this interpretation and put it in the mouth of Muslim there and said, look, you wear in hijab because you have a, this amazing uh, uh, idea of the, there is, a, there is distinction between being an exterior and you are not a, a subject of sexuality or anything else, but you are, but that's not true. The majority of Muslim wear in hijab because there is pressure from culture and pressure, religious uh, pressure. I mean, in the South, when I went to Iraq, I was amazed. The women, taxi driver cannot stop for women if she's not wearing hijab. Well, thank so. you, thank you. I, 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 hear your, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I hope you're wrong, of course. Um, but, uh, but, but I would... Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Do, do you, uh, you, you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I, I would just, uh, I lost Ahmed. you. Yeah, where is he? Yeah, there he is. <laughs> oh, um, have you read the book? No. Okay. I can't, I, I'm not here, this is not my DVD production. But I can tell you that a good deal of what you said simply is not what is reflected in the book. That is in terms of, uh, providing a political context for understanding exactly what the situation is. One sees very clearly the dichotomy between what some or many Muslims want with regard to, for example, transparency, good governance, and what actually exists in the Arab and Muslim world. It's stated very clearly there. So I think on a lot of those issues, it's stated there. I think with regard to uh, the issue of women, the, the question uh, in terms of the data is, what do women want, okay? In the book, it also talks about what the reality is for many Muslim women, okay? But one would also have to note that when you actually take a look, part of what, what is being said, and whether one likes it or not, there's enough data for it, that significant numbers of Muslims, including Muslim women, want their rights, but also want their religious values. That stands in contrast to some women's movements that are simply secular, and that's a reality, okay? And I can tell you that as somebody who has studied women's Muslim movements from North Africa to Southeast Asia over a 35-year period. Part of what is going to be controversial is that, and you see it in Iraq in terms of the debates that occurred in Iraq with regard to the Constitution and the role of Sharia. You see it in Turkey in the debates today. And that is distinguishing between what do majorities of women, including educated women, want, and what do some women's movements that are simply secular movements want. Both have a right to want what they want, but it does underscore the fact that simply interviewing secular elite women who happen to speak good English does not necessarily reflect what significant numbers of Muslims in societies want. On the hijab issue, it's much more, con uh, 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 much more uh, nuanced than what, you're, you know, th than what you, you think you saw. Uh, whether Dahlia's statement it here was misleading is one thing, but I would suggest that you want to look at the book, you want to look at the data. You can't just take you know, a statement that, it, you know, that, that a person makes in trying to explain something. I mean, it's, you know, you don't, we don't get to edit. I mean, you know, Michael did a great job, but it's not as if we're sitting there and editing ourselves all the time. No. So, I there mean, you know, no, that's... There's no script in this movie, and there's no voiceover either. So there is actually no editorial comment, in a way. I mean, these, these are individuals who've worked with this material sometimes for years talking about it. And they're neither right nor wrong. They're saying what they have to say. This is a case of see the movie, but read the book. Read the book. Yeah. I think we just have one more question at the end. Uh, good evening, and peace be upon all of you. I'm Ibnor, and I'm from the Singapore Interfaith Youth uh, Organization. And basically, I'm here for one year uh, studying management science and engineering. And I have two questions. Uh, 
it's mainly on, on my focus is on education and specifically about education of scriptures in the context of uh, mutual coexistence, uh, sort of trying to understand each other's scriptures and the learnings about, uh, about peace and, and the very definition of jihad. So my first question is, like in Singapore, there's a research being done on, on high school students in which uh, the, the, the Christians, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Muslims are given questions about the other religion. And the surprising result that, uh, that, that came from that research was that those in the madrasas or the religious, the Islamic religious school had a better understanding of the other religions and as well as they could actually relate their relationships uh, much better. And I would like to know if Gallup has such, have done such research uh, with regards to this. And the second question, which I think is more important, is uh, I would like to understand further the psychographics of the 7% about their educational background. I mean, have your research shown that uh, whether that 7% come from secular education or religious education? And... Uh, Basically, if we could pinpoint that, then I think uh, by, by having policies to, to sort of fo more focus on education and awareness as well as interfaith uh, dialogue would make a better sense for both America and Middle East as well as the whole Muslim and non-Muslim world. Yep, thank you. Uh, with regard to the first point, uh, and, and I, I've been in your country a number of times uh, over the years, and I'm fairly familiar with the, the system. I, I think that the general point with regard to the Muslim and the non-Muslim world, uh, but certainly with regard to the Muslim world, the Muslim world uh, lags significantly behind uh, Western countries when it comes to, if you will, education in comparative religions and religious pluralism. Uh, the fact is that in many uh, Muslim societies, um, there's a, a real concern about studying other religions, both the theological concern, if I study someone else, what will that do to my faith? Uh, and this also existed in, in the West. When I began to teach Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam in the uh, 1970s, I would have my students, I was teaching at the College of the Holy Cross, which is a very good liberal, liberal arts school, and they would say to me, my parents said, why am I taking your course? I have the true faith, why am I taking it? And then I'd have parents say that they were nervous that the kids would be studying this and it might affect their faith, okay? So as a result, one didn't touch it. Now, in many Muslim countries, there's another reason for it in addition to that, and as you know, it's political tensions in the country. Singapore is a perfect case of that. Um, and that is that people are very concerned, where you have multi-faiths, that it will just stir up the pot more. Mm. So the tendency is not to educate across religions <clears throat> because there's a nervousness. It's compounded by the fact that many people can't distinguish between teaching about religion and teaching religion. And that is a debate. Again, we fought that in America 35 years ago. It still comes up. That is a major part of what I think needs to be done in many countries today. That is to get to a point where our curriculum, whether it's a secular or religious school, where people who live in pluralistic societies, just as we study and appreciate other ethnic groups, other languages, we need to, to raise people who are, if you will, a multi-religious in their understanding because of the society they live in. Uh, with regard to the, your second question, uh, that wasn't, that, the distinction you're looking for in the second question wasn't there. What you can say about uh, the 7% is that they tend to be better educated uh, than, uh, than the, the others. Uh, they tend to be more sophisticated, more internationally aware, they are no more religious than the others, but it doesn't necessarily tell you where they went to school, so you wouldn't get, <clears throat> you wouldn't get that answer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John. Thank you all for staying this late. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.